Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bowl Bemmy. And I'm dead inside. Did you see Freya stop? No. She was like walking across and I went, hey, and she went. <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> Are you talking to me? No phones at work. Stop. It's my dad's birthday today and I might have to call him in a minute with my sister and wish him a happy birthday. So if all of a sudden you just don't see me or there's a weird edit or a weird cut. That is why. Happy birthday, Dad, inside. Happy birthday, Dad. Inside. <laughs> Demi, give us a recap. Okay. Demi's recap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time, all the kids were fighting with each other during dinner, and Wendy said, oh my god, I should just be a spinster. And then Peter came home and he said, I'm your dad. And then everyone started playing and dancing and having a good time. And then Peter goes... I'm having an existential crisis. I'm not actually their dad because then I'd actually be old. And Wendy said, no. And then he said, that's good. And then Tinkerbell said, you're an ass. And then they all had spooky shadows and they had a pillow fight and everything was really foreboding because it's all for the last time. <laughs> and then you're going to go all for the last time. Allegedly. I trust the narrator with my life. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you got a little... Oh, I think you got it. Go like this. Yeah, you got it. Oh, cool. Damn. You have a real good suck. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I really can't. <laughs> Chapter 11. Wendy's story. Listen then, said Wendy, settling down to her story, with Michael at her feet and seven boys in the bed. There was once a gentleman. I had rather he had been a lady, Curly said. I wish he had been a white rabbit, said Nibs. Quiet, their mother admonished them. There was a lady also. And, oh, mummy, cried the first twin, you mean that there is a lady also, don't you? She is not dead. Is she? Oh, no. I'm awfully glad she isn't dead, said Tootles. Are you glad, John? Of course I am. Are you glad, Nibs? Rather, are you glad, twins? We are glad. Oh, dear, sighed Wendy. Little less noise there, Peter called out, determined that she should have fair play, however beastly a story it might be in his opinion. I can't wait for this to be the most innocuous. Is that the right word? Innocuous? I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> like, just, like, plain basic story ever. The gentleman's name, Wendy continued, was Mr. Darling. And her name was Mrs. Darling. I knew them, John said, to annoy the others. I think I knew them, said Michael, rather doubtfully. No. They were married, you know, explained Wendy. And what do you think they had? White rats, cried Nibs, inspired. <laughs> no. It's awfully puzzling, said Tootles, who knew the story by heart. Quiet, Tootles. They had three descendants. What is descendants? Well... You are one, twin. Did you hear that, John? I'm a descendant. Descendants are only children, said John. Oh dear, oh dear, sighed Wendy. Now these three children had a faithful nurse called Nana, but Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard, and so all the children flew away. It's an awfully good story, said Nibs. They flew away, Wendy continued. <clears throat> To the Neverland, where the lost children are. I just thought they did, Curly broke in excitedly. I don't know how it is, but I just thought they did. Oh, Wendy, cried Tootles. Was one of the lost children called Tootles? Yes, he was. I am in a story. Hurrah! I'm in a story, Nibs! This is the most precious thing I've ever heard in my life. I want to cry. Hush. Now I want you to consider the feelings of the Now I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents 
with all their children flown away. Oh, they all moaned, though they were not really considering the feelings of the unhappy parents one jot. Think of the empty beds. Oh, <laughs> it's awfully sad, the first twin said cheerfully. I don't see how it can have a happy ending, said the second twin. Do you, Nibs? I'm frightfully anxious. If you knew how great is a mother's love, Wendy told them triumphantly, you would have no fear. She had now come to the part that Peter hated. I do like a mother's love, said Tootles, <laughs> hitting Nibs with the pillow. Do you like a mother's love, Nibs? I do just, said Nibs, hitting back. You see, Wendy said complacently, our heroine knew that the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back by, so they stayed away for years and had a lovely time. Did they ever go back? Let us now, said Wendy, bracing herself up for her finest effort, take a peep into the future. And they all gave themselves the twist that makes peeps into the future easier. Years have rolled by, and who is this elegant lady of uncertain age, alighting at London Station? Oh, Wendy, who is she? cried Nibs, every bit as excited as if he didn't know. Can it be, yes, no, it is, the fair Wendy. Oh, <laughs> this is so stinking cute. And who are the two noble portly figures accompanying her now grown to man's estate? Can they be John and Michael? They are. Oh, <laughs> see, dear brothers, says Wendy, pointing upwards. There is the window still standing open. Ah, now we are rewarded for our sublime faith and a mother's love. So up they flew to their mummy and daddy, and pen not, and pen cannot describe the happy scene over which we draw the veil. That was a story, and they were as pleased with it as the fair narrator herself. Everything just as it should be, you see. Off we skip like the most heartless things in the world, which is what children are, but so attractive. And yet we have an entirely selfish time. And then, when we have need of special attention, we nobly return for it, confident that we shall be rewarded instead of smacked. Damn. <laughs> He's like, basically saying like, these kids are cruising for a bruising. <laughs> So great indeed was their faith in a mother's love that they felt they could afford to be callous for a bit longer. But there was one there who knew better, and when Wendy finished, he uttered a hollow groan. What is it, Peter? she cried, running to him, thinking he was ill. Oh, so it's more like a, what is it, Peter? <laughs> she cried. What is it? Yeah. She felt him solicit, 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 solicit. Solicitously. Solicitously. Solicitously? Soliciously? Solicit. Soliciously? Solicit. Soliciously. That makes sense. <laughs> she felt him deliciously. <laughs> <laughs> what? She felt him soliciously lower down than his chest. Where is it, Peter? It isn't that kind of pain, Peter replied darkly. Then what kind is it? Wendy, you are wrong about mothers. They all gathered round him in a fright. So alarming was his agitation, and with a fine candor, he told them what he had hitherto concealed. I swear to God, if this is such an incredible plot twist right now, that he's like, I went back home. You know, because he's like, I'm never mm. going home. Like, I'm never going up. Like, if you did actually go home and he's actually a human kid. And then his mom was like, beep, boop, bop. <clears throat> yeah, but we can't really believe anything Peter says, Yeah, that's though. true. He's unreliable. Long ago, he said, I thought that, like you, I thought that, like you, that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away for moons and moons and moons. And then flew back, but the window was barred, for mother had forgotten all about me, and there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I am not sure that this was true, 
But Peter thought it was true, and it scared them. Are you sure mothers are like that? Yes. So this was the truth about mothers. The toads! Still, it is best to be careful, and no one knows so quickly as a child when he should give in. Wendy, let us go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, she said, clutching them. Not tonight, asked the lost boys bewildered. They knew in what they called their hearts that no one can get on quite well without a mother, and that it is only the mothers who think you can't, and that it is only the mothers who think you can't. At once, Wendy replied resolutely, for the horrible thought had come to her. Perhaps mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made her forgetful of what must be Peter's feelings, and she said to him rather sharply, Peter, will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied, as coolly as if she had asked him to pass the nuts. Aww. He's heartbroken. Not so much as a sorry to lose you between them. If she did not mind the parting, he was going to show her, was Peter, that neither did he. But of course he cared very much, and he was so full of wrath against grown-ups, who as usual were spoiling everything, that as soon as he got inside his tree, he breathed intentionally quick short breaths at the rate of about five to a second. He did this because there was a saying in Neverland that every time you breathe, a grown-up dies, and Peter was killing them off vindictively as fast as possible. Whoa! Oh. Okay, <laughs> like, calm down. Then, having given the necessary instructions to the Redskins, he returned to the home, where an unworthy scene had been enacted in his absence. Panic-stricken at the thought of losing Wendy, the Lost Boys had advanced upon her threateningly. <laughs> It'll be worse than before she came, they cried. We shan't let her go. Let's keep her prisoner. Aye, chain her up. <laughs> Whoa. In the, <laughs> Jesus. In her extremity, an instinct told her... An extremity? Probably extremity. Probably. In her extremity, an instinct told her to which of them to turn. Toodle, she cried. I appeal to you. Was it not strange? She appealed to Toodles, quite the silliest one. Grandly, however, did Tootles respond. For that one moment, he dropped his silliness and spoke with dignity. I am just Tootles, he said, and nobody minds me. But the first who does not behave to Wendy like an English gentleman, I will blood him severely. Whoa, this is like went from zero to 60 <laughs> so quick. He drew back his hanger, and for that instant, his son was at noon. Hello? He did... Wait, can you do it again? His, want me to say it again? Yeah. He drew back his hanger, and for that instant, his son was at noon. I don't know what that means. Yeah, me neither. The others held back uneasily. Then Peter returned, and they saw at once that they would get no support from him. He would keep no girl in the Neverland against her will. Wendy, he said, striding up and down, I have asked the Redskins to guide you through the wood as flying tires you sow. Thank you, Peter. Then, he continued, in the short, sharp voice of one accustomed to be obeyed, Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, though Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for some time. Who are you? How dare you? Go away, she cried. <laughs> you are to get up, Tink, Nibs called, and take Wendy on a journey. Of course, Tink had been delighted to hear that Wendy was going, but she was jolly well determined not to be her courier. And she said, and she said so in still more offensive language. Then she pretended to be asleep again. She says she won't. Nibs exclaimed, aghast at such insubordination. Churlish and insubordinate! <laughs> Whereupon Peter went sternly toward the young lady's chamber. Tink, he rapped out. If you don't get up and dress at once, I will open the curtains, and then we shall see 
Then we shall all see you in your ne- negligee. Why is that negligee? Did that mean something different back then? Or like night clothes? Because a negligee is like kind of like a sexy thing. That feels. <clears throat> Maybe that's what he's getting at. It's kind of weird. This made her leap to the floor. Who said I wasn't getting up? She cried. In the meantime, the boys were gazing very forlornly at Wendy, now equipped with John and Michael for their journey. By this time, they were dejected, not merely because they were about to lose her, but also because they felt that she was going off to something nice to which they had not been invited. Novelty was beckoning to them as usual. Crediting them with a nobler feeling, Wendy melted. Dear one, she said, if you all... If you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. Oh. The invitation was meant specially for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped with joy. But won't they think us rather a handful? Nibs asked in the middle of his jump. Oh no, said Wendy, rapidly thinking it out. It will only mean having a few beds in the drawing room. They can be hidden behind the screens on first Thursdays. Peter, can we go? They all cried imploringly. They took it for granted that if they went, he would go also. But really, they scarcely cared. Thus children are ever ready. When novelty knocks, to desert their dearest ones. That's so sad. Like, poor Peter is just being left behind by everyone that he holds dear. You know? And he's going to be left all alone. All right. Peter replied with a bitter smile, and immediately they rushed to get their things. And now, Peter, Wendy said, thinking she had put everything right, I'm going to give you your medicine before you go. She loved to give them medicine, and undoubtedly gave them too much. Of course it was only water, but it was out of a bottle, and she always shook the bottle and counted the drops, which gave it a certain medicinal quality. On this occasion, however, she did not give Peter his draft, for just as she had prepared it, She saw a look on his face that made her heart sink. Get your things, Peter, she cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I'm not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter. No. To show that her departure would leave him unmoved, he skipped up and down the room, playing gaily on his heartless pipes. She had to run about after him, though it was rather undignified. To find your mother, she coaxed. Now if Peter had ever quite had a mother, he no longer missed her. He could do very well without one. He had thought them out and remembered only their bad points. No, no, he told Wendy decisively. Perhaps she would say, I was old and I just want always to be a little boy and to have fun. But Peter, no. And And so the others had to be told. Peter isn't coming. Peter not coming? They gazed blankly at him. Their sticks over their backs and on each stick a bundle. Their first thought was that if Peter was not going, he had probably changed his mind about letting them go. But he was far too proud for that. If you find your mothers, he said darkly, I hope you will like them. The awful cynicism of this made an uncomfortable impression, and most of them began to look rather doubtful. After all their faces said, were they not noodles to want to go? N- noodles? Like crazy or oh. wild or, you know. Noodles are pretty crazy and wild, so I guess that makes sense. <laughs> are you a noodle? A little noodly. Now then, cried Peter. No fuss, no blubbering. Goodbye, Wendy and he held out his hand cheerily, quite as if they must really go now, for he had something important to do. She had to take his hand, and there was no indication that he would prefer a thimble. You will remember about changing your flannels, Peter, she said, lingering over him. She was always so particular about their flannels. Yes, and you will take your medicine? Yes, that seemed to be everything, and an awkward pause followed. Peter, however, was not the kind that breaks down before other people. 
Are you ready, Tinkerbell? He called out. Aye, aye. Then lead the way. Tink darted up the nearest tree, but no one followed her. For it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the redskins. Above, where all, where all had been so still, the air was rent with shrieks and clash of steel. Below, there was dead silence. Mouths opened and remained open. Wendy fell on her knees, but her arms were extended toward Peter. All arms were extended to him, as if suddenly blown in his direction. They were beseeching him mutely. They were beseeching him mutely not to desert them. As for Peter, he seized his sword, the same he thought he had slain barbecue with, and the lust of battle was in his eye. Fuck. Dude, he's gonna go on, like, my feelings are hurt rampage. Because men. <clears throat> it would also be cool if he didn't just tell all the Lost Boys, like, you were about to leave me, go get fucked, like, fight the pirates yourself, I'm out of here. Like, I could see Peter doing that, but at the same time, it'd be cool if, like, he didn't. <laughs> what a, like, heartwarming and also heartbreaking, like, chapter. You know? Like, all the kids are just, like, so excited and they want to have, like, mothers because they had, like, Wendy and they're like, that was a pretty good time. And then poor Peter just doesn't want to grow up. I don't think he ever had a mom. <clears throat> there was, like, a... Yeah, I don't think he's a... I don't think he's a human boy at all, so I don't think he had a little mommy. Um, There was a line that said, if he ever had a mother... Like, he couldn't be sure or whatever. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? You know? Like, because he doesn't have a mother and never did, never will. I think that's, like, the narrator's way of being like, no mom. Never had one. He's never had a mom because he's not a human baby boy that would have a mommy mom. Hear me out. What if Peter isn't really, like, a being from somewhere but he is created or he has been created by children's like hopes and dreams and like or he's the amalgamation of all the children that get fucking like thrown out maybe that he is like this sort of um because like john and wendy and michael like all knew about neverland so I wonder if it's just like all of these like children's imaginations combining together to like materialize Neverland and all of this like make-believe stuff in the magic and like it materialized Peter. And that's why Wendy like <clears throat> knew him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's like, he's kind of like a part of like all the kids. Because I mean, like, every kid like wants to run away, right? A little bit. Or is that not normal? I don't know. Drop it in the <laughs> comment section below. As a little kid, did you want to run away? But not like in a, in a, I don't know how to like explain this. Without this. I don't know. Maybe. You know what I mean? Like you want to run away for an adventure. No, I know what you mean. Okay. You're staring at me like, I'm fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was giving you the stare of like, um, what? But no, I know what you mean. 100 per cent. I had a, I had this little bag that I put together when I was a kid and I stored it in the back of my closet and I had like a pillow and a blanket and like a change of clothes, like just in case I ever like needed to like run away on an adventure. <clears throat> Do you have like a stick and a handkerchief and you're like, you put it on the stick like... Well, here I go. I'm running away. No, I think it was like a little backpacky thing. I don't know, but I always had it stashed in the back of my closet. Mm. I don't think my parents ever knew <clears throat> that it existed. I feel like they'd be alarmed. Remember one time I was packing my bag to run away mm -hmm. and I put a potato in there. <laughs> the essentials. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was also my school backpack. And then I had to unpack everything and put my books back in there but i forgot about the potato 
<laughs> and it was a very, very long time that potato was in there. Very, it was very stinky. At one, you had to throw that bag away. Uh, I don't think we did. <laughs> your mom and was so like, I, you're going to live with your choices. Yeah, and so I had like a potato stink bag for a long time, <laughs> but then the new binder I got didn't fit in the bag, so I was saved by the next year's binder, and I was able to get a bigger backpack. Did you run away? Did you make it out? Yeah, I, I just ran down the street. Oh, you know my cul-de-sac, and then there's like that offshoot street. Oh, okay. Like ran away there, and I Hell was like, yeah. "This is where I'm gonna live now." I think that's like the prime spot for like a little <clears throat> kid to run away to, though. Yeah, and there was like that weird crack house. Oh, you don't know. You you weren't around for that. <laughs> so like around the corner, a little like probably like 120 yards from my house, there was like this abandoned crack house that hobos used to go fucking like do crack in and shit. Yeah, and there was, like, <laughs> it's, like, long been since torn down. But, like, that's where I was going to go run because I was, like, I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to go live with them. And I just remember, like, getting up to the house and being way too scared because it was scary. Very it, good. It was, like, really stinky. And oh. I just fucking I just fucking sprinted away. How old I were you? Because I heard something inside. You probably did. There's only a person in there. Yeah. They're probably like thought the cops were coming to get them. They heard footsteps. They were panicking. You were panicking. Everyone was just panicking. Just like a little kid with a potato in a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? Young, very young. Elementary school. Ooh, I love that you had a potato. I love that so much. <laughs> like, what were you thinking about Dude. that potato? <laughs> it's got everything you need, baby, except what B twelve. <laughs> It's actually true, though. You could live off potatoes and, like, B12 vitamins. Hey, you were a smart kid. That's all I can say about that. That's hilarious. Also very lucky, because I ran to a crack house. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when we have friends and they go, your life sounds like a movie, I'm like, no. But then you tell me shit like that, and I'm like, that sounds like a movie. <laughs> uh yeah, I want to say they definitely tore that house down before I was in middle school. I was not around then. <clears throat> I know, but I'm giving you an age parameter of when I would have gone there. Thank you. I think it was third grade-ish time frame. Okay, so you're like seven or eight, probably. Yeah, around then. Because I want to say when I was going into middle school... Sixth grade, they bulldoze that fucking place to the ground. It's probably for the best. <laughs> That's where I saw my first syringe in the wild. <laughs> and my first nudie mag. Did you go in there? Yeah. <laughs> like as a little kid, I knew what a needle was. Because I'd been stuck by them. Not in the crack house. <laughs> what the fuck? You can't just say shit like that. I mean, like, like at the doctor. Okay, Jesus. Probably shouldn't have ever gone in there, to be honest, but. Honestly, yeah. Kids do be kids. Okay, well, you got anything else to add? Because that was too much of my life to share. <laughs> we'll make final cut. I gotta go call my dad. It's his birthday. Okay. So thank you everyone so much for watching. If you guys like the video, don't forget to hit the like button. Also subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a video when it goes live. If you hit that bell notification, you'll be notified when it does go live. Don't forget to check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash dead inside. And if you are experiencing any of these symptoms, nausea, <laughs> diarrhea, heart palpitations, aneurysms, insomnia, heart attack, or death, or death, <laughs> you might be entitled to the financial compensation, but probably not. And we'll see you in the next one. Oh my god. Unless, of course, the symptom you had was death. Then we will not see you in the next one. Oof. But hey, to die would be an awfully big adventure. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, you want me to turn the headphones on while I'm calling my daddy? Yeah, sure. Cool. On. <laughs>